Good afternoon, everyone. Our next speaker is Rajat Arya, who is the co-founder at ZHub. He founded it over 20 years. He has over 20 years of industry experience in various roles, including support, engineering, product, and sales. Some highlights include co-designing the ML data platform at Apple, shipped first version of Microsoft OneDrive, being an early engineer in AWS RDS, and being the first employee of the ML startup Graph Lab. Please give a warm hand in welcoming Rajat Arya. That was so nice. I did not expect an introduction, so I have a whole slide to introduce myself that I don't have to use. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Rajat. I'm a co-founder of ZHub, and you've heard a little bit more about me, but I don't know anything about you. So I'm going to need your help, because this has to be interactive, because we're in person. This is like the one thing we get to do together is have interactive sessions. So show of hands. How many folks in here are software engineers, like me, by training? Few, all right. How many are machine learning engineers? Few, okay. How many data scientists, data analysts? All right. Product design? All right. Any executives? Like, I have to raise my hand for that one, too. Okay, none. Oh, I'm pretty excited. No investors in here, right? That's like the... The real way to know how great an event is is like how many investors are there. So it's very exciting. No hands went up, in case you were wondering. OK, so for today's talk, thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, delaying lunch a little bit to spend some time with me. I'm going to start with a really lofty concept. And then throughout the talk, I'm going to ground it into something very practical that you can take away and use later this afternoon. I'm going to move pretty fast. And I have to admit, a bunch of my slides come from my co-founder, Yu Chang, who's a PhD in machine learning and is just way smarter than me. So you'll have to forgive me as I stumble through some of the, the harder, more technical slides. I hope to have time for questions at the end. So I'm going to plow through pretty quick. And again, we're starting from a really lofty concept and bringing it down to something practical you can take away. All right. So it's been a pretty interesting couple of years, right? Feels like we can divide the world into two halves now since 2023, BC and AD, before ChatGPT and the AI disruption. I had to work a bit to get the acronyms to line up, but I think this does a good job of reflecting how much the world has changed. And that's where we're going to start today. Oh, and an obligatory ChatGPT generated image of this as well makes a lot of sense. So if we're at, the, we're at this transition, we are beginning the AI disruption. So it's really important that everybody remember that we're at 1 AD right now. We're at the infancy of this disruption. That's a really important point that we're going to keep coming back to. So let's, uh, it's nice to have an image. It's like nice to think about before and after. But let's kind of ground this in an example. So let's take, let's take a real world example and see how we would do things before ChatGPT versus now. So the thing we're going to try and do is figure out why my car won't start. So my, my car won't start. What would I do before ChatGPT? Well, I mean, I'd need to build a model, right? And what would my model do? Well, I'm trying to learn the probability of what's failed, given that my car won't start. So I'm probably building a probabilistic model, maybe a Bayes net. I've got to take into consideration all the features of a car. And then I have to use a bunch of different things, like conditional distributions, or uh, I have to do parameter learning in order to get started. Well, you're going to need a lot of depth in statistics to get somewhere in this world. But we're not in that world anymore, right? We're at 1 AD. So what's it like now? Well, now we just ask ChatGPT. We give a prompt like, 
you're diagnosing car failure, the car doesn't start. Please provide a ranked list of issues to investigate as well as the estimated probabilities of each issue being the root cause. And we get some great answers here. In fact, the top answer is a dead battery. It makes sense. That's a pretty common reason why cars won't start. So let's say I go and evaluate this top issue that the model returned for me, that the battery's dead. I check it. Actually, the battery's fine. Oh, so what would I do next? Well, I think I'd just ask ChatGPT to give me an updated list. We investigated the electrical system, including the battery, and none of them appear to be the problem. Can you provide an updated ranked list of issues to investigate, as well as their estimated probabilities? And there we go. Something amazing just happened here. I just did conditional probabilities without actually knowing anything about conditional distributions. Now, is the model calibrated, mathematically sound? Who knows? But does it matter if it's useful? So what's changed is that many things that would require a PhD in statistics or machine learning, like my co-founder Yu Cheng has, can now be done easily by all of us. And that's incredible. AI, ML is truly accessible to anyone. But you haven't forgotten, right? We're still in 1 AD. So what is, what's actually happening? What is this transition? AI has shifted from a scientific discipline of experiments to an engineering discipline, where we're now primarily concerned with engineering principles, product delivery, and so on. Oh, I was trying to think of a word for this, and I, I don't like the word democratize too much, so I went with a totally different word, one I made up, the engineeringization of AI. I don't know if you guys enjoy that word as much as me. So what's the difference between scientists and engineers? Let's take a, let's, you know, let, let's, uh, let's investigate this a little bit more. As an engineer, I can totally, uh, I can say the biggest difference I see is that engineers really like to build stuff. So it's only been a couple years, but we have thousands of startups building tools for machine learning. And we can actually ask ChatGPT to help us to verify this. So in my previous startup, in, in 2013 or so, I felt like I knew every ML startup in the, every startup in the ML space. And ChatGPT kind of reflects that. There's 550 back in 2016. That sounds about right. 2013, there were fewer. Well, how about in 2023? Today? Thousands. So I thought I'd show this with some logos. So here's a logo wall from Israel, Sweden, the US, the UK. And this is not even anywhere near complete. We'll zoom in on one of these, mostly because you know, Zhub's on this one. We're in the uh, versioning and experiment tracking category. So we have so many tools. There's a proliferation of tools everywhere. It raises the question, what do we use? Which foundation model? Which embeddings? Which vector database, et cetera? So we're not quite to the practical part yet. So I have to, I'm going to switch and tell you that's the wrong set of questions to ask. And I'm not going to tell you what to use. If you came here expecting me to cut through the noise, I'm not going to do it. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Instead, I want to share some principles that you should think about when you're building AI applications. But before we, sh we talk about principles, let's look at how things are evolving even in these last couple years. Some basic trends. So this is a graph of the state of the art for the MMLU 
uh, benchmark, which is a language understanding benchmark. And what you can see is the best models keep getting bigger and bigger. But what you can also see is that smaller models uh, keep becoming more useful. They become more competitive against bigger models. Now look, this isn't scientific. We're just eyeballing it. But this trend isn't new. So let me restate the trend in some words. The best models will keep getting bigger but the useful models will keep getting smaller, and all the models will keep getting faster. And we've actually seen this in computer science over and over again, from SAT solvers on to other domains. So this is one trend that you see. I wanna talk about another one that's a little bit more controversial, and I'm a little nervous because this is recorded, so, uh, you know, in a couple years, you all can come back and tell me how wrong I was. But I want to I wanna state something that, that I, I think is true, and time will confirm it for me. I think a lot of the tools today for AI exist simply because of the limitations of the existing foundation models. Tools like RAG or techniques like RAG try and address the limitations on context window from foundation models, and that fine tuning is expensive. Techniques like agents try and overcome the, that foundation models can't plan very well today. Though I've got, you know, fire icons, and this, this is a, a controversial thing to say, because everyone's talking about RAG and agents today, I just want to remind everybody that we're in 1 AD. In the future, I think we're going to have different solutions. We're not going to need the same techniques that we're using today. And the reason I bring this up is as you're thinking about building AI applications, you can't get locked into one set of techniques because we're too early in this AI disruption and things are going to keep changing. In fact, how do we handle this? As an organization or as a business, how do we think about the right architecture for AI? How do we think about, in a world where things are immature and the techniques that are there may not be the same ones in three to five years, how do we go about getting started? Well, I, I think we attack it like any other engineering problem. So what are the principles that we should use here? I have four of them. The first one is to have clear objectives. So what do I mean by objectives? Accuracy, precision, recall, K-shot retrieval, model metrics, what do you guys think? No, we're not gonna use any of those. In fact, those are useful when you're training a model or evaluating a model to another, so it's not to say that all model metrics are, are useless, but they're not the right, it's not the right objective for an AI application. Instead, you have to think about what, what's the point of your application? What are you actually trying to accomplish? Is it time savings, engagement, click-through rate, conversion? You have to know what you actually want and how you're gonna measure it. And that's the objective by which you evaluate your AI application. So it's a little different than ML research or AI research because it really doesn't matter how well your model's performing if your application isn't performing well. So you have to think about this. This is why it's the first principle. Let's use an example. Let's take a question from earlier. Which foundation model should I use? Well, I told you I wasn't gonna tell you which one to use, right? So I'm not gonna give you an answer, but I'm gonna say you should approach this like you would any other product requirement. Make your decision with questions like, is there internet access? What happens if the model fails? And let that guide your decision-making process. There's no consistent way to compare models. So what does that mean? Bigger is not always better. 
newer is not always better. So like you do with a lot of things in software, start with the smallest thing and work your way up. So this is the first principle, have clear objectives. Number two, the AI can be wrong. This is obvious to ML practitioners, but there's a piece of it that we learned at Apple that I think is worth discussing specifically, which is because the AI can be wrong, you have to bring that into your product design. And you have to think about that from the very, very beginning. What type of user experience should I offer when my AI can be wrong? Let's, uh, let's take a simple example. Say I build superaidoctor.com that allows a doctor to upload an x-ray image and returns a classification. I mean, this sounds great, right? Wouldn't we all want this? If you do ship this, you may have inadvertently positioned your model as a confident expert. Someone that's unfamiliar with the limitations of AI, maybe your user in this example, a, a medical doctor, can completely misinterpret the results. So you have to know what happens when the AI is wrong. Third principle, software engineering best practices still apply. So let's review them really fast, super fast. Code reviews, continuous integration, testing, and reproducible artifacts. If you distill software engineering down, these are three of the key best practices for building anything with software. So everybody's using this. This is great, right? And then your manager says, let's do AI, and now what do you do? What changes from your existing process? Well, actually nothing. All of these are still important. Only difference is you have to deal with this massive brick called data. And when I use the word data, I mean not just your data sets, but your models and your features and your embeddings and all of the parts that build your ML application. They can, be, they can easily be a million times bigger than your code base. But you know, other than that, you know, it's no big deal. It's the same. And so I'll mention, uh, this is the only time I'll mention ZHub directly. This is what we do at ZHub. We enable the software engineering workflow for machine learning projects. So this massive brick of data is much easier to handle. It's just a scaled up Git repo. And really, all this means is you've got to treat the data in your AI application just like a dependency in your code. And maybe this is the TLDR one-line summary of the fantastic paper from Google in 2015 about technical debt machine learning systems. I think this paper is great. If you haven't read it, you really should. So, so now we're dealing with this, we've got this brick of data. When you're working on demos or prototypes, do whatever you want, that's fine. But when you're getting to production, your tools should always enable you to have reproducibility, testability, and collaboration. And the challenge with ML data is that it has to be first class in each of these processes. How can I reproduce my model if I don't have reproducibility in my data? How do I test with my data? How do I collaborate on my data? Think about those processes and make sure you pick tools that are applicable and make the most sense for your needs. Especially important for software and for AI applications, this first one on reproducibility. Um, we kind of take it for granted in the software world that oh, I can just run the build again, everything's fine. But that's not the case when your data is not, uh, is where your, the data that's used to train your model or generate your features is just a pointer to some uh, data lake somewhere. You don't know if someone's changed the data lake out from under you 
or it's a query to a data warehouse, you don't know if someone's changed the warehouse out from under you. And we've seen this happen in practice. And the last principle, we're gonna go to one of the great leading minds in the software development world. We're gonna go to Grug. And Grug says, given choice between complexity and one-on-one, -on -one, or one-on-one -on -one against T-Rex, Grug takes T-Rex. At least Grug C T-Rex. So you have to minimize complexity. And you, this is important for AI applications, especially because there are more moving parts than in a traditional software application. You have to expect that things are going to change. The thing you build now will likely be deprecated in a few years. So you want to pick the system that has the lowest maintenance and the least overhead. Again, you want to avoid getting locked in. So in summary, we have four principles for bring, thinking about AI as an engineering discipline. Clear objectives. Your design has to include understanding what happens when, you're, when the AI can be wrong. Still doing software engineering. And you have to reduce complexity. If you look at these four, there's not a lot in them that's about AI. These are really just the same common engineering and product principles. And I think that's the main takeaway. AI as an engineering discipline is very much bringing software engineering practices into your AI workflow. So I thought I'd, I'd close, I'd spend the last few minutes before questions showing you what this can look like in practice. What can it look like if you bring the software development lifecycle into your AI development? What does that really mean? So we started lofty, we have principles, now let's get into, ooh. I hit the mic, uh, something practical that you can take away and think about your next ML application or AI application and applying these principles to it. So we talked about collaboration. What's that mean for AI development? Well, the first thing is it can't be your notebook that runs on some Python environment you can't recreate on your laptop or on one cloud instance. Everybody on the team's got to have consistent tools consistent workflow. You have to embrace peer reviews. This is the secret in collaboration and in software engineering. Software engineers are trained through code review. You know the best practices in an organization because you see everyone else's code reviews. That needs to be there for AI development or else new people on your team are going to make the same mistakes over and over again because they're not able to learn from what everyone else has learned from. Huge transitive knowledge transfer properties. And then you've got to use version control specifically for experimentation. The number of times I've, I've worked with teams that uh, don't have version control for experiments, they spend all their time copying data and then not, keeping not being able to know which version was used for what, and getting lost in that. Can I delete this version of the data? I don't know. Is it still getting used? I don't know. So that's part one of collaboration, or part one of the, the AI development lifecycle. I have a, a small video to show another piece of it, which I will play. And the idea here is when you're working on an AI application, you spend a lot of time in an intermediate state. You're experimenting, you're trying things. And teams waste so much time sharing intermediate results with everyone else on the team. I've talked to so many data scientists that spend hours every week formatting data frames to share with others. So it's important that your collaboration tools make it easy for you to share intermediate results with everyone else involved. A lot of times the AI applications have business stakeholders, have technical stakeholders, and you want to be able to share a link. You don't want to have to copy a plot out of a, uh, out of a Jupyter notebook, send it in Slack, or put it in a, in a slide deck and share that slide deck. Because then two weeks later, someone's going to come back and ask you to reformat it, and now you have to remember how you did it. Instead, if your collaboration tools make it easy for you to stand up uh, an interactive dashboard, 
then you only have to do this once. And you can share that link with everyone that needs it. So that's all you're seeing here. The other thing that this video is showing is it's important, not everyone on your team maybe feels comfortable with version control tools. So make it easy to be able to upload new data sets in the browser. OK. On to data. What do you, I have five minutes? OK. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. I better speed up. OK. Um, so when I think about the development lifecycle for data, it's really important to understand how things change and how they've changed over time. So here, you want to make sure your tooling can make it easy for you to summarize your data sets. Using techniques like one-pass sketch summaries are effective because then you can compare the summaries of data sets evolving as opposed to looking at the raw data itself. So what you're seeing on the left is a summary of a data set, and on the right, you can see the before and after of a change to it. If you look really carefully, you can see that this uh, categorical variable called paperless billing uh, all of the no's were removed. So that's a pretty big change to my data set. For models, use model metrics in development. I know I foo fooed them earlier, but they're very useful in development. But it's even more important that you understand the model behavior. So for a tree-based model, use something like feature importance. This is much closer to that objective, the clear objective, for what your application is being built for. And then it's important that you can compare before and after here so you can see what's changed. Even useful for deep learning models so you can understand the model architecture changes along with the weights. So software development, continuous integration and testing. I'll call that compute. It's needed for AI development to generate the summaries, the visualizations, and other analyses. But it's important that the execution environment is consistent. Because if it's running on your laptop, that's not going to work on someone else's. And then the third piece here is the results, the artifacts of this computation, have to be referenceable back to the changes themselves. Just like continuous integration, you have to be able to take the artifact and go back and say, what changes happened? What, when, where did this come from? Now, when you have all of these, you get to having full observability over your ML application, over every asset. If you start with this collaboration features, add, can track how your data set changes, Understand how your data set changes. Understand what the behavior of your model's evolution is. Leverage compute that gives you consistent execution. And then extend this to all the assets in your ML project. You've got full observability. You have AI as an engineering discipline. Thank you. If you want to, oh. So I've got a few questions. I've got time for a few questions. I should mention that uh, Zethub, we're here at, in the hallway out there in the corner. So uh, I'm happy to talk more after our time. Uh, or you can meet some of the other folks from the team. But questions now. No questions. Come on. Ah, question in the back. I like it. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering, you, you suggested that in the earlier part of the presentation that the tools and the way we approach ML projects is bound to change. Uh, and in your uh, product, you're showcasing like specific examples on how you track data and maybe like processes. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee these things changing significantly throughout 
Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. I think, just? yeah, so um, like a, a good example, maybe I, I go, oh no, no, oh, it's taking too long. Okay, this slide. Um, so I've got a couple visualizations on this slide around adding observability to, to every ML asset. Well, these aren't pre-baked into uh, into Zethub, or you shouldn't. You should make sure these are not uh, locked in or pre-baked into the solution you're looking at. In other words, these should be extensible and flexible, so that as the way you understand your your ML assets uh, changes, you have new. You can you can adapt those visualizations accordingly. I don't know if that is what I'm trying to say. Is um, it's not good if your solution says, hey, I can give you feature importance um, because you might not care about feature importance in a year. It's much better to say, hey, uh, I can take some Python code and I can render it and store it as an artifact. Um, that is far more flexible and extensible. So I, I'd look at it that way. It's a great question. When you talk about versioning, um, I think there are versioning of the code of the model and data. And in the context of LLM, how do you version the version of the model? Like uh, if you experienced catastrophic forgetting, can you revert back to the previous version? Or oh, it's uh, very yeah, difficult. Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, the LLM is nothing more than a model. It's just very large. So you can. You can check in that model. But it would significantly increase the cost if you have a lot of version, right? Ah, so it's really important that your versioning solution is designed efficiently. Um, definitely come by and talk with us at ZHub if you want to know how we do it. But yeah, it's, it's super important that you're only tracking what changes in the model as opposed to the whole model over and over again. Any other questions? Counting down? I think that was a stretch, not a question. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time. Appreciate it.